So there were there are there are two districts already existing. But Congress decided to have a third district. So it reorganized these two districts and came up with three. Aquino claims that there is a violation of the requirement under the Constitution with regard to population because that new district that would be created would have less than 250,000 inhabitants. The Supreme Court said that requirement refers only to the creation of new cities. So it does not have anything to do with the creation of a legislative district for the purpose of representation in Congress. So a city with 250,000 inhabitants would be entitled to one representative. It is a minimum requirement. But when it comes to provinces, it's not necessary for the purpose of coming up with a legislative district. The court noted that in the Constitution itself, that reference to 250,000 is about cities, not provinces. So that's the case of Aquino versus Combele. Then for those who are from Malolos, we have that recent case of Aldaba versus Combele. And if you, you notice there was a news account last week that Malolos may have to hold a special election. Why? Because of that decision in Aldaba. When the Supreme Court came up with that decision, it was already too late to again revise the ballots for Malolos. So what is the decision in Malolos or in Aldaba all about? It's something to do with a new congressional district for Malolos. So as we said, under the Constitution, there's a requirement that there should at least be 250,000. In the case of Malolos, they made use of projections. By those projections, they came up with the figure that by this year, there will at least be 250,000. So with that, they now created a new congressional district for the city of Malolos. The Supreme Court said the use of projections here would be improper because it failed to comply with certain regulations as to how to make use of projections. For one, the projection was made not by the NSO itself. It was done, I think, by the regional director, but it should be something that is done by the national agency itself. Two, the, <clears throat> the certification as to the projected population was not made by the duly authorized persons who can certify the same. And also, the Supreme Court said the intercensal population must be based on the projected population by the middle of the year. But here, it was not also followed. So because of these deficiencies, that intended new congressional district for the city of Palolos would not push through. And the Supreme Court also made use of the percentage of growth that was used in this projection and came up with a different figure. So assuming that the projection is 3.5% every year, it made use of the same projection and said that based on its computation, there would be less than 250,000 by this year. Therefore, it is not proper to create a congressional district for Malolos when there is no certainty that it would already have that number of, of inhabitants by this year. So that's the case of Aldaba. In the case of land area, 
there's also a requirement that for purposes of creating a province, for instance, it should have at least a minimum area. For a province, it should be 2,000 square kilometers. Under the 1973 Constitution, we have that interesting case of Tan versus Combele, where the proponents for the creation of a new province try to comply with the area requirement by counting the sea. <laughs> the Supreme Court said, no, you can only count the area which is the land area. You cannot count, for instance, the waters around that particular intended province just to comply with the area requirement. In the recent case of Navarro versus Ermita, this has something to do with the proposed creation of the province of Dinagat Islands. So we said that under the local government code, the minimum area should be 2,000 square kilometers. The new province consisting of one main island and several other islets would only have about an area of 812 square kilometers. So how would Congress create a new province simply based on an area that's not even 1,000 square kilometers? The proponents made use of the implementing rules of the local government code, which exempts from the 2,000 square kilometers minimum requirement a province consisting of an island or more islands. The Supreme Court said that provision of the implementing rules is, un is invalid because it provides for an exception that is not provided for in the law itself. The law does not speak of any exception based on the fact that the province to be created consists of an island or more. So since there is less than the, the minimum area requirement, then the province of Dinagat cannot be created. In regard to the need for plebiscite, in the case of Pagapoyo versus Kobelec, we have here the creation of a second legislative district for Cagayan de Oro. Bagaboyo claims that you cannot create a new legislative district if there is no plebiscite. The Supreme Court said the plebiscite requirement is only needed in regard to the creation, division, merger, abolition, or other changes regarding the boundary of a local government unit. But would not be required when it comes to the creation of a new legislative district. Mm -hmm. The creation of a new legislative district does not result in a new political unit. You only have a new representative unit, but that by itself is not a corporate unit. So what would happen is that a, an old political unit would get an additional representation. Unlike the creation of a new political unit, you would still have the same city of Miguel de Oro. It's just that it now would have more representatives compared to the past. So there is no requirement for a plebiscite. The Supreme Court also noted that the requirement for a plebiscite originated with the 1973 Constitution. So it was not a requirement previously, and it's only now 
following the 1973 constitution that we have institutionalized the requirement of holding a plebiscite. And moreover, since if you're going to create or divide or abolish a, an old political unit, you would be affecting the inhabitants, then there's a need for a plebiscite. But when you increase the representation, there is no similar need to hold a plebiscite. For those from Isabella, not Pasila, you're familiar with the case of Miranda versus Aguirre. This has something to do with the city of Santiago. When the city was created, uh, it was created as an independent component city. So it was duly approved in a plebiscite. Then there was a move to convert it or to downgrade it into a component city. So from an independent component city, which means that it would have nothing to do with the provincial affairs since it would not be allowed to vote for provincial officials, it is sought to be converted to a component city. Can that be done by simply amending the law that created it? So instead of retaining the word independent, you just take that out by way of amendment such that it would now be simply a component city. The Supreme Court said it cannot be done without a plebiscite. So even as it is merely a downgrading, since, since it would affect the status of the city, then it similarly needs a plebiscite. It would not just be done by mere of an amendment of the charter of the city. In regard to the settlement of boundary disputes, if the dispute is just between barangays of the same city or municipality, it doesn't matter who they have to be resolved by the city or the municipality. If the dispute is between or among municipalities of the same province, then it would be the same province. If it's between two provinces, then it would have to be the respective or sangkunians of these provinces. So they would have to be deciding it, deciding it jointly. And what about if it's about a dispute between a component city and <clears throat> or an independent component city and a municipality? So the independent component city would not be properly considered as within the authority of the province itself, whereas the municipality is. So who would now settle that controversy? In the case of municipality of Cananga versus Madrona, the Supreme Court said since it does not clearly or it's not provided for in the local government code, then this falls within the jurisdiction of the regional trial court. And take note also that from decisions of the Sangunian for those which are clearly set out in the local government code, appeal may be held to the regional trial court. In the case of Calanza versus Paper Industries Corporation of the Philippines, this involves certain small or <coughs> small scale mining. So certain people apply for a license or a permit to conduct small scale mining. And this was granted by the governor of Davao Oriental. The permit allowed them to enter the area, the concession area occupied by the Paper Industries Corporation of the Philippines. So the permit was granted by the governor of Davao Oriental. 
it turns out that the area that is supposed to be granted to these miners is not found in Davao Oriental, but in Surigao del Sor. So, there is now a dispute as to whether it's really within Davao Oriental or Surigao del Sor. So what they did was to go to court, a, an RTC court in Davao Oriental, and this court was then asked to decide whether they could enter the Pico premises. The Supreme Court said the RTC here had no jurisdiction to entertain the case. Why? Because there's a procedure provided for involving boundary disputes. There is no certainty as to whether it's really within Davao Oriental or Surigao del Sor. The governor of Davao Oriental gave the permit, but Pico is claiming that the area that's covered by the permit is actually in Surigao. So there is now a dispute. And according to the local government code, since it involves two provinces, then it's supposed to be resolved by the two Sangonian. Or, but of course, there should first be an attempt at amicable settlement. If it cannot be worked out, then it's time that the Sangonian of the two provinces would have to resolve the dispute. But here, there was, not, uh, there was no compliance with that procedure. Instead, it was immediately to the RTC. The Supreme Court said the RTC only comes in after a decision shall have been rendered by the Sangonian. But if there's none, then there should not be any direct recourse to the, to the RTC. In regard to the exercise of powers by the local government code relative to the fundamental powers of the state, like police power, power of eminent domain, and taxation, take note that the so-called general welfare clause is provided for in section 16 of the local government code. So under the local government code, the, the local government units may exercise a delegated amount of police power. That necessarily means, therefore, that the exercise must be not contrary to the national law. And it must, as a general rule, be confined only to the territory of the local government unit. When it comes to the exercise of the power of eminent domain, that's provided for in Section 19 of the Local Government Code. Under the general power of eminent domain, there is the requirement for the taking of private property for public use and the requirement for the payment of just compensation. However, under the Local Government Code, there are additional requirements when it comes to the exercise of the power of eminent domain. Aside from public use, it may also be for public welfare, public benefit, for the poor and the landless. So it's more expansive in so far as authorizing the exercise by the local government units of that power. There is also the requirement that there must have been a definite offer made to the owner, but the same was not accepted by the owner. This particular provision was relevant in the case of Jesus' historic Christian school versus city of Pasig. Because in that case, the Supreme Court found that there is no adequate proof that there was really a definite offer made to the school and which was not accepted. So because of that, the intended expropriation was not allowed. Also, there is a requirement that there must be an ordinance 
to authorize the chief executive of the local government unit to exercise the power of eminent domain. So it cannot be by a mere resolution. Other than the previous local government code, it can be by resolution. But under the 1991 local government code, it must be by ordinance. So if there is no ordinance and there is only a resolution, that would not be a valid basis for instituting expropriation proceedings by a local government unit. Again, as we have discussed, when we are talking about the case of King Goyon, <clears throat> in so far as local government units are concerned, they must also deposit 15% of the fair market value of the property in order that they would now acquire possession of the property that they seek to expropriate. So this is in contrast to Rule 67, which only requires the deposit of the assessed value. The assessed value will of course be lower than the than 15% of the fair market value. Then going back to the case of Masike, remember once more that a motion to dismiss filed in, ex in an expropriation proceeding should not be considered as a hypothetical admission that the facts alleged in the petition for expropriation are valid or admitted. So it does not, this, a motion to dismiss does not connote that the owner is now saying that there is authority or there is a necessity for the acquisition of his property by means of the power of eminent domain. And in so far as this allowance by the provincial Sangunian of the power of a local government unit to exercise eminent domain. The same must be based on the reason that it's not within the power of the local government unit. So if there is any other reason, like it is not wise, it's not proper, then that would not be enough basis because the power to expropriate belongs to the local government unit itself. So that power cannot be disapproved if there is no legal basis for the same. In regard to the power of taxation, as we have previously said, this is now directly conferred or delegated by the Constitution, subject only to such guidelines and limitations as Congress may provide consistent with the idea of local autonomy. So under the local government code, the local government units have been given the power to impose taxes on certain properties or institutions that used to be exempted, particularly government-owned and controlled corporations. And we have lately some interesting developments relative to this. So if you remember in the early case of Mactan Cebu International Airport, the Supreme Court said that the local government or the local government units can now impose taxes on government owned and controlled corporations because under the Local Government Code of 1991, the exemption of the GOCCs had already been lifted. Therefore, Mactan Cebu International Airport cannot complain, cannot assert once more a tax exempt privilege. Then, several years later, the Supreme Court decided the case of Manila International Airport versus Court of Appeals involving an attempt on the part of 
the city of Paranaque to tax the properties of the Manila International Airport Authority. What is interesting here is that the Supreme Court appeared to have ignored Matanza with the National Airport in deciding favorably for Manila International Airport Authority. So when you look at both institutions, Matanzago International Airport Authority and Manila International Airport Authority, they seem to be of the same nature. They both are responsible for international airports. They have in their names also properties belonging to that airport, like the buildings, the airport, and other outlying areas. But the Supreme Court came up with an entirely different resolution. In the case of Bhaktan Sabu International Airport, the Supreme Court said that it was a GOCC, or a government-owned or controlled corporation. So if Mactan Cebu International Airport Authority is a GOCC, it follows that Manila International Airport Authority should also be a GOCC, is it not? The Supreme Court said, no, it is a government instrumentality. So why is it not a GOCC? The court said, it is not a staff corporation or a non-staff corporation. Why is that? It's not a stock corporation because it does not have any stocks divided into shares. So, it should be non-stock. No, it's not also a non-stock corporation because it does not have any members. Since it is neither a stock or a non-stock corporation, then it is not a government-owned or controlled corporation. In the case of Mactan Cebu International Airport, the properties were titled in the name of Mactan Cebu International Airport. They have been transferred from an earlier government office to the Mactan Cebu International Airport. And these properties were therefore deemed taxable because they were no longer belonging to the government. They were now in the name of a different person, even if it might be a government-owned or controlled corporation. The same way, the properties were also transferred from the government to the Manila International Airport Authority. So the airport the buildings are in the name of Manila International Airport Authority. So we should follow the lead of Mactan Sabu International Airport, right? The, the properties should also be taxable. The Supreme Court said no. Why not? Because they are only being held in trust for the national government. Accordingly, it is actually the national government that owns them, even if the title is in the name of Manila International Airport Authority. So, what is the consequence of characterizing Manila International Airport as a government instrumentality instead of a GOCC and saying that the properties in the name of MIAA are just being held in trust for the national government? The purpose is so that they would not be they would not be subject to local taxation. And what is also noticeable in this case is that the Supreme Court somehow gave the cold shoulder to Mactan Cebu International Airport that decision. In what way? It decided the case as if that earlier decision did not exist. 
It's just like being cold shouldered by your girlfriend. You know all along that you're just beside her, but to her, it's as if you don't exist. And just this thing uh, complained about that treatment. He dissented. He said that we're acting like children. That by pretending not to see something, it, they would now believe that that something does not exist. But that's not the case here. We have earlier decided the case of McTansa International Airport. And the honorable thing for us to do is to at least explain why we are not following what we earlier said in McTansa International Airport instead of somehow abandoning it sub silencio. Because there was even no express pronouncement that they were now abandoning their decision in McDonald's with the National Airport. It's just that they did not even talk about it in saying that MIAA is exempt from, excuse me, local taxation. This decision of the Supreme Court was subsequently applied in a more recent decision. That's a case of MIAA versus City of Pasay. <laughs> so it's still the same ruling. And take note also that the ideas expressed in the case of Manila International Airport Authority were subsequently assimilated in a case involving the GSIS. So for that purpose of discussing the GSIS, we'll talk first about the case of City of Davao versus Regional Trial Court. In that case, following the enactment of the Local Government Code of 1991. The city of Davao imposed real estate taxes on the properties of GSIS. GSIS claimed that Davao cannot impose taxes because it was tax exempt pursuant to its charter as provided by a presidential decree. But the local government code stated that the GOCCs were no longer entitled to tax exemption. And GSIS was a GOCC. So should it be subject to, to tax? The GSIS said, while it may be a GOCC, its charter had a provision which, pro, which stated that its tax exemption may only be removed if it is expressly and cate categorically or manifestly repealed by another law. So there should be no implied repeal. The Supreme Court said that provision is not valid. When the local government code lifted the tax exemption privilege of GOCCs, it also included the tax exemption privilege of the GSIS. What about that provision which stated that there must be an express and manifest repeal of the tax exempt privilege? The repealing clause of the local government code was only general. It did not expressly refer to the charter of GSIS. So, could you say that there was a valid repeal? The Supreme Court said yes, because that provision regarding the conditions for the repeal of the tax exempt privilege of GSIS partook of the nature of an irrepealable law. 
how would you say in part two of the nature of an irrepealable law when that provision precisely allowed for repeal but only subject to certain conditions? The Supreme Court said imposing those kinds of conditions would themselves be the form of irrepealable law. Because the conditions on the plenary power of Congress should only come from the Constitution itself. It cannot be imposed by itself. Imposing those conditions would be adding, therefore, to the limitations on the plenary powers of Congress. And that cannot be done. It partakes of the nature of an irrepealable law. So that's the case in the or that sensation, the case of City of Davao versus Regional Trial Court. Now, in the case of GSIS versus City Treasurer and City Assessor of Manila, the Supreme Court started to sing a different tune. Of course, you have to remember that the ponente of the earlier case of Davao has now retired, Justice Dina. So perhaps it's easier for the Supreme Court to say something new when the one who penned an earlier decision is no longer among them. What's the decision of the court now in the case of GSIS versus City Treasurer? In this case, the City of Manila also decided to impose real estate taxes on properties of Manila, of GSIS. And this is also pursuant to the lifting of the tax exempt privilege pursuant to the local government code of 1991. The GSIS claimed that it was tax exempt. Of course, the City of Manila would claim it's not. The Supreme Court said, yes, GSIS is tax exempt. And making use of what it said in the case of Manila International Airport, it now characterized GSIS as a government instrumentality, not a GOCC. Why not? Because it is not also either a stock or non-stock corporation. Therefore, it is not a GOCC. It is a government instrumentality. And being a government instrumentality, then it is exempt from real estate taxation pursuant to the local government code. But aside from that, the Supreme Court also made reference to the fact that under the new charter of GSIS, it is also tax exempt. This was also noted in the case of City of Davao. Because in that case of City of Davao, the Supreme Court made reference to the fact that after the tax exempt status of GSIS was lifted by the local government code, Congress subsequently revised the charter of the GSIS, which then restored the tax exempt privilege of GSIS. So in that regard, the tax liability of GSIS would only be for a few years. But in this new case, the Supreme Court is now saying that the decision in the City of Davao overlooked something in the revised charter of the GSIS, which is that GSIS is deemed to have already satisfied its tax liabilities and therefore should not be paying anything, even for that period when its tax exempt privilege was lifted. So under the new Supreme Court decision interpreting the revised charter of the GSIS, GSIS is not liable for any back taxes. This is not the same as what the Supreme Court said in the case of City of Davao. But more importantly, 
the Supreme Court now has a different view about irrepealable laws. As we said, in the case of City of Davao, the Supreme Court held that if a law imposed certain conditions, like requiring express or manifest repeal, that would be something akin to an irrepealable law. In the case of Jess I.S. versus City Treasurer, the court said that's perfectly okay. Congress can provide conditions for the repeal of a law such that there would be no implied repeal of it. And the Supreme Court also noted that under the new charter of GSIS, that provision has been reincorporated like the one that was found in the old presidential decree. So it really makes it a little difficult to follow the Supreme Court, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What's the rule when it comes to back wages for government employees? Or is there such a rule? Before 67.15, what was the rule when it comes to illegally dismissed private employees? You did not discuss that with Joe, So before 67.15, you have the three years straight back wages rule for the private sector. Before that, you had mercury drug rule. Then when 67 came in, it became full back wages. But for the private or for the public sector, you had five years back wages rule. Is that still valid? As recently as September, I think, or August last year, there was a decision by the Supreme Court reaffirming that so-called five-year back wages rule. But the problem is there were other decisions in the past whereby the Supreme Court, in effect, said that it should be full back wages. Nevertheless, we would still have a problem here because the Supreme Court never really expressly abandoned that five-year back wages rule. So they just mentioned that it should be from the point or the time of dismissal until reinstatement, without saying that we are now abandoning the five-year back wages rule. And that must have been the reason why last year there was that affirmance or reaffirmance of that five-year back wages rule. Anyway, that should provide for interesting practice of law. Lawyers thrive on others' problems. So that's just like what happened in the case of GSIS and Manila International Airport. Manila International Airport abandoned, without expressly saying so, Mactan Cebu International Airport. And the case of GSIS also seems to have modified, without expressly also saying so, the earlier decision, the case of City of Davao versus Regional Trial Court. When it comes to taxation, even as the Constitution has delegated the power to the local government units, you have to constantly remember that Congress still retains control. That's why you have the case of Bayan Bell. 
regarding the tax exemption as embodied in the franchise of Bayern Therefore, since Congress still retains the power of control, then it can validly exempt certain properties from local taxation. When it comes to reclassification of lands, the same must be done through ordinance. And it must be shown that in that in the hearing conducted before then, that the land has now become economically feasible, or this has to be economically feasible or sound for agricultural purposes, and therefore it is fit for some other purposes like residential, business, or commercial and industrial. In the closure of roads, take note of the recent case of Figuration versus Lippi. As a general rule, even local roads are supposed to be subject to the control of the, of the national government in so far as their disposition is concerned. However, the Supreme Court said that under the local government code, the local government units are given the authority to close roads and therefore dispose of them. So in the past, because they are considered as part of, of the public property that is subject to the control of Congress, they could not just be closed for purposes of converting them to certain uses or even for purposes of disposal, but under the local government now, they could be closed and thereafter disposed of. In the case of Libby, there was a property that was expropriated by the city of Peru, but eventually it was determined that not every part of that property need to be used for, I think, a road. So the owners, the previous owners, wanted to repurchase it. And the city allowed them to repurchase it. So an issue was raised as to whether it could be done. And the court said yes, because of now this issue, or this provision of the local government code. In regard to freedom parks, again remember the case of Bayan versus Carmita, where the Supreme Court noted the fact that in the entire country in 2006, when, the, when this case was heard, it appeared that there was only one freedom park, and that was in Fuentes Peña in Cebu. <laughs> The Public Assembly Act of 1985 provided for the creation of freedom parks. But you have to remember that shortly after that, you had the EDSA revolution. So perhaps because of the exuberance brought about by a successful revolution, the, the local governments already forgot all about the freedom parks. But the freedom parks are supposed to be part of the guarantee to enable the people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. So each local government unit was mandated to create freedom parks. But apparently this was forgotten. So the idea again cropped up when the issues with regard to the conduct of rallies came about. And the Supreme Court said, because of the sad state regarding compliance with the requirement for the setting up of freedom parks, all plazas and parks would be considered as freedom parks until and unless the local government unit shall, shall have designated the appropriate freedom parks. So what is the value of having freedom parks? 
Well, in freedom parks, assemblies could be held without any need for a permit. Nevertheless, the Supreme Court also said that even as there is no need for a permit, still there must be notification to the local government authorities so that they can coordinate assemblies that may be held in these parks. So it's not for the purpose of a permit. It is instead for the purpose of saying to it that the freedom parks could be utilized in a manner that would not lead to problems. Because what if several groups would like to hold a rally at the same time? Then they may only end up in chaos instead of exercising in an orderly manner the guaranteed freedom to assemble and provision for redress of grievances. And related to discussions on freedom parks is the recent case of IDP versus Atienza. Can the mayor change the venue requested for the conduct of a public assembly without explaining why? The IDP requested for a rally at the foot of the Menjola Bridge. The mayor instead issued a permit to be held at Plaza Miranda. Is that valid? The Supreme Court said no. The mayor should explain why it could not be held in the place requested by the applicants. And for that, the standard is the clear and present danger rule. Therefore, the mayor could not simply say, no, you hold it elsewhere. The Supreme Court said he cannot exercise discretion in a capricious or whimsical manner. Because when the, the persons deciding to hold the rally want to do it in a particular place, there must be a reason for that. Therefore, it could not just be changed at the whim or caprice of the mayor. In relation to local legislative action, so that may come the form of an ordinance or a resolution. An ordinance would be like the local law itself. It refers to something permanent, whereas a resolution would be temporary or just an expression of the body's sentiments. For the purpose of enacting ordinances, the Sangurian may also have hearings. Does the Sangurian have any subpoena or contempt powers just like Congress? In the case of Negros Oriental versus Sangurian Panunzot of Tumaguete City, the Supreme Court said that subpoena and contempt powers are judicial in nature. They do not flow from the exercise of legislative power. Therefore, for the Sangurian to exercise such powers, the same must be then delegated to them. Accordingly, if there was no delegation made to them by Congress, then Sangurian cannot exercise such powers. So that's the case of Negros Oriental Electric Cooperative versus Sangurian Panunzot of Dumaguete. In the recent case of Onsoko versus Malones, Supreme Court said that the requirement for a notice 10 days before the hearing, which is intended for the purpose of a revenue ordinance,
must be strictly complied with. So it cannot be that the notice be after. It's, it must be before, 10 days before the hearing. So if the hearing was held less than 10 days, then, or it was 10 days after the notice, then that ordinance would not be considered valid. And in the case also of Vergara versus Ombudsman, there was a case filed against the Sanpurian or the mayor here with regard to the fact that the mayor signed a contract without a ratification coming from the Sanpurian. So this is supposed to be, or allegedly, a violation of the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act. The Supreme Court said what the local government requires is prior authorization, not ratification by the Sanpurian. Here, the mayor was already previously authorized by the Sanpurian. Therefore, after he signed the contract, there was no more need for a subsequent ratification by Sanpurian. On municipal liability, take note that in the case of Municipality of San Juan versus Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court said that the municipal liability under Article 2189 of the Civil Code would still make the local government unit responsible even if the property involved is a national road. The local government unit is supposed to regulate roads, streets, highways within the territory. Here, there was a street digging for a public utility, but which was improperly prepared, and therefore it caused an injury to a passing motorist. That motorist then filed a case against San Juan. The road is national. So should that be the responsibility or liability of San Juan, since it's a national road and not a local road? Supreme Court said under Article 2189, it does not matter who owns the road for as long as it's within the territory of the local government unit. Because responsibility is on the local government unit. The police power of the LGU to regulate diggings, for instance, would also impose upon it the responsibility to ensure that no injury would be occasioned by those diggings. In filling this versus flood affected homeowners or merit bill, the issue here is about flooding. It was stated that Philip West was the one, the first one to develop a home or a subdivision in that area. It's near a river. Then subsequent subdivisions also develop around that. It so happens that the area that was divided by, or that was developed by Philip West is lower than the rest. So whenever the river nearby would then overflow, the subdivision that was developed by Philip West became a catch basin. The water from the higher areas would now go down to the subdivision developed by Philip West. So of course the homeowners complained. Philip West tried to somehow alleviate the problem, but still it was hopeless. So whose responsibility is it now? Philip West, the MMDA, or 
the city of Las Piñas. The Supreme Court said, in so far as the overflowing of the river is concerned, that cannot be the responsibility of Philippines. The task of trying to dredge the river to avoid silting is not the responsibility of Philippines. Philippines has already tried what it can, but since it is primarily caused by the heavy silting of the river and by the fact that the other subdivisions are higher than its property, then it cannot be avoided that its property became a touch basin. So who would have the responsibility of dredging the river? MMDA? No, the Supreme Court said not the MMDA. You say MDA is just responsible for coordination. It should therefore be the city of Las Piñas. It is part of its responsibility relative to the need to maintain these public services. In so far as legal representation is concerned, there is a requirement that a local government unit must be represented by a government lawyer, not by a private lawyer. So that may be the past, the provincial prosecutor or the city prosecutor. In the case of Manzanito versus Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court said that even as a rule is that there should be representation by a government lawyer, such as the public prosecutor or by the city legal officer, for instance, if there's one. If the officials are sued, both in their public and their private capacities, and there's a possibility that they may be personally liable, then they may employ private counsel to represent them in that regard. But the general rule again should be the government lawyers representing the LGUs. In the case of ASEAN Pacific Landers versus City of Ordereta, the Supreme Court noted that legal representation for cities are supposed to be done by the city legal officer. But before that, it was handled by the city prosecutor. Now, what happens if, in the meantime, there has yet been no city legal officer appointed? The position is still vacant. So who would then represent the city? The Supreme Court said that it would have to be the city prosecutor yet, because there is yet no appointed city legal officer. In regard to local officials themselves, there are certain restrictions on them, which is normal in government employment. In the case of Tevez versus Sandigan Bayan, the charge is with regard to violating the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act relative to maintaining an interest in a cockpit by a mayor and his wife. The Supreme Court eventually convicted only the mayor, and this time not for violation of the of the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act, but the provision of the local government code. Subsequently, an issue was raised as to whether this conviction would constitute moral turpitude. The Supreme Court said no, and therefore that meant that the mayor would run for public office once more. With regard to the practice of professions, local chief executives cannot practice their profession. 
However, members of the Sangkulian can practice their profession, provided that it does not conflict with the discharge of their duties and responsibilities. In the case of Cato versus Reliosa, Reliosa is a barangay captain in one of the barangays here in Manila. As such, barangay captain, he presided over one conciliation proceeding. But the parties could not arrive at an amicable settlement. So he issued the necessary certification that they may now proceed to the court. So the complainant before the Barangay Conciliation proceeding eventually filed the appropriate case before the court. And to her surprise, when the defendant showed up, he was represented by Reliosa. So an administrative case was filed against him for conflict of interest. An investigation was conducted by the IBP. And the IBP said that Reliosa was guilty of violating Rule 6.03 of the Code of Professional Ethics, which prohibits former government lawyers from accepting or getting employed in regard to something in which they had earlier participated while they were still in government service. The Supreme Court said Rule 6.03 is not applicable here. That particular provision of the Code of Professional Responsibility applies to a situation where a lawyer has already left government service. Reliosa is still in the government service as a barangay captain. Instead, what the Supreme Court said was for lawyers in the government service, the general rule is they may practice their profession provided that they obtain the authority from their head of office. For the Sangburian or for the local government units, the chief executives are not allowed to practice. For the Sangburian members, they are allowed to practice pursuant to the provision of the LGC. Therefore, there is no need for them to secure authority from the head of office. There is no provision with respect to barangay captains or members of the barangay council. So what obtains, insofar as they are concerned, would be the general rule that they should obtain the permission of the head of office or the department head. In this case, since he is a barangay captain, the department head would be the DILG secretary. And it was shown that he did not obtain the permission of the DILG secretary and therefore he is deemed to have violated the code of professional responsibility. So I think he was suspended for some three months or six months, I'm not sure anymore. But he was suspended for having practiced his profession without securing the permission coming from the DILG secretary. So that's in violation of legal provisions and therefore can be a basis for dealing with him administratively as a lawyer. For local officials or elective officials, there are certain requirements. So just like any other elective position, there are certain requirements. One is citizenship. 
another one would be residency. In that case of Torino versus Comene, the governor of Misamis Oriental, Emano, was then approaching the end of his three terms as governor. So, after his term of office would have ended, he would no longer be entitled to run for the position of governor again. But he wanted to run still for public office. So what he did was to register as a voter of Cagayan de Oro less than a year before the elections. He, however, indicated that he had been a resident of Cagayan de Oro for a long time, even before then. So the issue here is, can he run as mayor of Cagayan de Oro, considering that he had been governor of Misamis Oriental the years immediately preceding his running for the city mayor. Cagayan de Oro City is a highly urbanized city. Therefore, it is not part of Misamis Oriental. And being governor of Misamis Oriental, he also indicated an address different from Cagayan de Oro. It so happens, however, that the capital for the province of Misamis Oriental is found in Cagayan de Oro. And for purposes of residency or actual residence, a man of state in Cagayan de Oro. So, Cagayan de Oro was a highly urbanized city, independent of Misamis Oriental. But the capital for the province is found in the city itself. And the governor had a house in Cagayan de Oro. So, did he meet the residency requirement? Theoretically, it would appear that he is not a resident of Cagayan de Oro because he was the governor of a province which was in which Cagayan de Oro was not part. But the Supreme Court said, no problem. He complied with the residency requirement. You have to remember that the residency requirement is meant to ensure that whoever runs for public office should be somehow familiar <coughs> with the features, the problems, and other concerns of that particular locality. So you cannot just allow a stranger to run for public office in a particular place. In this case, even as he was governor of the province of Misamis Oriental, he was staying in the city itself. So it cannot be denied that he was familiar with the problems, concerns, or other aspects of the city and for which he was running as city mayor. In that case, the Supreme Court said he complied with the residency requirement. Therefore, he can run for mayor. And after that, I think he was able to run for mayor for three consecutive terms. And when the third term came to an end, he ran for the position of vice mayor. So there was already a break for the three-term limit. And now I think he's running again for the position of mayor. So he worked out an arrangement with the one who became mayor so that after the break, he would be back in his position. That's a case involving Mayor Emano of Cagayan de Oro. On literacy requirements, you have the case of Deuce versus Comelec, in which somebody has been running for a barangay captain, indicated in his birth or in his certificate of candidacy that he was a certified public accountant. So he was 
charged with a material misrepresentation in his certificate of candidacy because it turns out that he was not really a CPA. There was a hearing conducted and there was also a subpoena issued to the PRC to find out if he was really a CPA or not. And the PRC certified that when he took the board exams, he flopped, getting something like 40-something. <laughs> so that became public knowledge as to what he really got during his board exam. Anyway, is that material misrepresentation, claiming that you are a CPA when you actually flopped? The Supreme Court said it is not. There is no requirement, educational requirement, for that particular position. As a matter of fact, there is even no educational requirement to become president. So that is not a material element in a certificate of candidacy. And if you indicated that you were a lawyer when you were when you are not, that's the same thing. Because it's not a requirement for the position. <laughs> All disqualifications, one of the grounds would be conviction of a crime involving moral turpitude. And that would mean that you would have to serve out first, or you would be disqualified from, for about two years after service of sentence. In the case of Moreno versus Comelec, The issue here is whether someone who had been granted pardon would have to serve out that two-year period before he can run for public office. The Supreme Court said someone granted, or I mean it's not pardon, it's probation. Someone who is granted probation is not disqualified at all. Because probation has the effect of suspending the sentence. So there is no period that is needed to be observed before he can run again for public office. For one who is convicted, he would have to wait for two years after service of sentence. But for one granted part or probation, since in effect there is yet no or there is yet no punishment to be served, then he is not even disqualified from running for public office while he is on probation. So that's the case of Moreno versus Pomelec. In regard to the ground removal in an administrative case as a basis for disqualifying a person for running for, for public office, take note of what Supreme Court said in the case of Greco, that this one has no retroactive effect. So if someone had been removed from office in an administrative case before the local government code, then this particular provision would have no application to him. In the case of Reyes versus Pomelec, the, I think it was a mayor, had been charged administratively and there was a decision by the provincial Sangunian removing him from office. What he did, however, was to make an arrangement so that the notice of his dismissal would not be served on him. So he refused to receive it and he again ran for public office. So is that considered, or is he deemed to have been removed from public office, considering that formally and on the record, he has not yet received the order for his dismissal. The Supreme Court said he should count from the time that it was sought to be served on him and he refused. So from that time on, he start counting the reglementary period. 
So what's the effect? That judgment became final. And therefore, it was then removed from public office. Another disqualification would be about dual citizenship. So you have that old case of Mercado versus... Is he running still for vice president? <laughs> I don't have seen any of his advertisements. Do you see it? If you remember, Manzano was born in Frisco. That's in Quezon City, right? No. He was born in San Francisco, but his parents are Filipinos. And by reason of that confluence of circumstances, he was both a Filipino and an American. Then he decided to run for vice mayor of Makati, and there was a ground cited for his disqualification, namely dual citizenship. So under the law, a person with dual citizenship is supposed to be disqualified. The Supreme Court said that should be construed as dual allegiance. Until now, I still have a difficulty understanding how the court could have said that dual citizenship actually means dual allegiance. <laughs> because it makes it appear that Congress didn't know what it was saying. While it is true that what is provided for in the Constitution is about dual allegiance, but is it not well within the power of Congress to make the qualification? not only based on dual allegiance, but dual citizenship. So if Congress really intended dual allegiance, it could just have written dual allegiance, but it chose instead the word dual citizenship. Anyway, the Supreme Court said you should read that as dual allegiance. <laughs> and in the case of Manzano, he is not guilty of that. He had dual citizenship, but not necessarily that that would be the one referred to by the Constitution because it's dual allegiance. And moreover, when he filed his certificate of candidacy, he already renounced his American citizenship. So by the act of filing his certificate of candidacy, he was no longer a dual citizen. In regard to dual citizenship and running for public office, under RA 9225, as you remember, Filipinos who were naturalized in foreign lands may now reacquire through repatriation their, their Filipino citizenship. But the court has also said that this should mean that they should renounce their foreign citizenship before the filing of their certificate of candidacy. So it cannot simply be done through the filing of a certificate of candidacy. They must already be simply Filipinos at the time they file their certificates of candidacy. There's a problem with the candidacy of, the, of one of the daughters of Lo Shutan, is it Because it was claimed that at the time when she registered as a voter, she was not yet a Filipino because she only got repatriated subsequently. Let's just hope that it gets again to the Supreme Court so that it could enrich Philippine jurisprudence, correct? Anyway, it would not be any of your concerns anymore. Because by the time the Supreme Court will decide, you should already be on your way to becoming lawyers. On fugitives from justice, those from Quezon should be familiar with their former governor, that's Rodriguez. So in the earlier case of Marquez, there was a contention as to whether Rodriguez could be considered as a fugitive from justice or not. And the Supreme Court said that fugitive of justice did not necessarily be someone who has already been convicted. 
then eventually you now have the case of Rodriguez because he got elected as governor of Quezon. And the Supreme Court said he could not be, a, he could not be considered as a fugitive from justice even if a criminal case was eventually filed against him. Because at the time he left, there was yet no charge. So you cannot simply assume that he left, as in California, just to run away from a criminal prosecution. So he's not a fugitive from justice because there was yet no charge at the time he left the foreign land. When it comes to residency, we have that case of Kasi involving a Green Cross holder. What are you doing with that? The more you hide yourself, the more that you become prominent. A green card holders allowed to take the bar. <laughs> green card holders are not American citizens yet. They only have the permission of the U.S. government to be permanent residents in the U.S. So green card would simply signify permanent residency. But I think one of the requirements for being a green card holder is to have to, to regularly go back to the U.S. Does anybody want to go with there the next time she goes? In the case of Kaasi, the mayor here was a green card holder. And he was thought to be disqualified on account of that. And the Supreme Court sustained the ruling for his disqualification. He may not be a foreign citizen, but the fact that he is a green card holder or a, for, a permanent resident elsewhere would be consistent with the idea that he should be representing the population of a particular area. So he may be mayor, but considering that he's a green card holder, his allegiance is also to that foreign state. Therefore, he cannot properly represent his constituents. Now, let's talk about term limits. So you notice that under the 1987 Constitution, term limits would be applicable to all elective positions. And so far as barangay, barangays are concerned, that is up to the, to the Congress. And Congress has also provided for a three-term limit for mayors and members of San Julian, same, three-term limits. And this is all the way to members of the House of Representatives. For the Senate, it's just two terms. The same with the Vice President. But for the President, it's just a single term. It's unfortunate that the case for the disqualification of ERA never got to the Supreme Court. Because there was an issue as to whether he can run again, considering that he had already been elected to the presidency. Because under the language of the Constitution, the President shall not be eligible for any re-election. And the contention of the ERA cap, I think, is that since his term had been interrupted, and moreover, that prohibition should be understood as referring to the incumbent President, then he cannot be disqualified from running for the presidency again. What are his chances anyway? 
Perhaps the people were not interested to pursue that legal issue anymore since it might just become moot and academic anyway. Why still bother? But it could have been a very interesting case, isn't it? What if okay, and 2016, making use of the same arguments of ERA, GMA would try to run again? By then, the composition of the Supreme Court would have been rather radically altered, right? So on term limits, we start off with the case of Borja versus Comerec. If the ascendancy is by succession, then that is not considered as within the three term limit. So if the mayor dies and the vice mayor becomes mayor, he fills up the remaining period of the term of the former mayor. That is not considered as within the three term limit. Court said he must have been elected to that position and should have served that position. Now we have several variations of the three term limit. If, for instance, on the third term the mayor was defeated and thereafter in a subsequent recall election he ran and won. During the next regular election, can he run? Supreme Court said, in the case of Bolsonaro, yes, because there was already an interruption in his term. There was already an involuntary renunciation. Then in the case of <coughs> Socrates versus Comelec, Hagedorn here was mayor for three consecutive terms. Therefore, he did not run for the fourth term because he was prohibited from doing that. During the term, however, of the mayor who succeeded him, Socrates, there was a recall election. And he filed his certificate of candidacy. Can he run? during that recall election, considering that that would have been his fourth term. The Supreme Court said yes, because there had already been an interruption from the time when he did not run to the time that he ran for a recall term. Now the issue that was also touched upon by that case is whether that recall term would be considered as a term for purposes of computing the three term limit. Meaning, would that recall term be considered as one term such that he could only run two other times after that? Or can he run for three full terms after the recall term? In the case of Socrates, the Supreme Court, by way of obiter, said that would be a term. Therefore, that means he could only run two other times after that. However, the following month, the Supreme Court came up with a decision that was not published in this graph. That's the case of Mendoza versus Comerec, where the Supreme Court said that a recall term is not considered as a full term for purposes of computing the three term limit. This is something to do with the governor of Bataan. Anybody here from Bataan? The governor is Roman. So he started his career as governor of Bataan by way of a recall election. After 
after that, he ran and won for one full turn. After that, another full turn. And then, he also wanted another full turn. So the opponent said, that would already be the fourth turn, not simply the third. Because if you count the recall term, then that would really be the fourth. But the majority the Supreme Court said, no, you do not count the recall term as a term for purposes of computing the three term limit. So you exclude that. You only count from the time that he was elected to a full term. In the case of La Casa, The mayor here was the mayor of a municipality and during his third term as mayor of that municipality, it was, that municipality was converted into a city. So there is now a new political status for that particular local government unit. From a municipality, it is now a city. Now, can the mayor run again, this time as mayor of the city, considering that the city is different from the municipality? Because if he would now be allowed to run, that in effect would be his fourth term. Can he do it? The Supreme Court said no. Even if there is now a new local government unit, that transformation from a municipality to a city would not affect the three-term rule. You have to remember that it would still be the same territory, still the same set of people. Therefore, even if the municipality was converted into a city, a mayor who has already been serving for three consecutive terms cannot run immediately for a fourth term. More recently, we have the case of La Seda versus Comelec, and this time the issue is about a barangay captain who had been a barangay captain for three terms, and during that period, his barangay was merged with the barangays of some other, one other municipality. So two municipalities were merged to form a new city. So two municipalities got together and became a new city. Can the barangay captain, who had already served three terms, run another term, this time as barangay captain, for that same barangay, but now part of a new city. The Supreme Court said, applying the case of La Tassa, that it cannot be done. Why? Because he would still be serving as barangay captain of the same territory and same electorate. So even if that barangay has now become part of a new city is still the principle would apply. He cannot run for a fourth term. Now we have these interesting cases of Ong, Rivera, and Dizon. Rivera and Dizon are directly interrelated and you can appreciate how it came out. Anybody here from Mabalat? <laughs> You're a neighbor. <laughs> she could very well relate. <laughs> Are you still the same mischievous student that you were? <laughs> So let's first take the case of Ong. Here, 
the mayor was elected three consecutive times. During his second term, there was an election protest against him. It was decided against him. So should that be counted against him or counted in his paper such that he can now run for the fourth time? If you just play or just put it that way, then it would be justified for him to run for the fourth time because he actually lost the second term until you are told that he actually served the full second term. So how did he do that when he lost the election? Well, the judgment in favor of his opponent only came about after the term had already been fully served. <laughs> So the term ended in June, but the decision came in July. And by that time, he was already into his third term. So it was his contention that since he actually lost the second term, then that should not be counted against him. The Supreme Court said, you cannot do that because you actually served as mayor for three consecutive terms. The victory of your opponent, in so far as the second term is concerned, is inconsequential. It did not produce any effects anymore. In the case of Rivera, the mayor here was also defeated during his second term. But the judgment against him only became final after the second term. So in effect, he fully served the second term. So using the same principle as in Ong, the mayor is deemed to have served three consecutive terms. By the time the Supreme Court decided this case, that mayor was already sitting for his fourth term. Because the decision was only decided, I think, April or May, one and a half months before the, the expiration of the third term, or the fourth term. So first term, no problem. Second term, he won, but an election protest was filed and that decision was against him. However, the decision became final after the term. Therefore, his opponent never got a chance to sit. <laughs> so he ran the third time, he won again. Then he ran the fourth time, and there was a case for his disqualification on account of the violation of the three-term rule. He said, I'm not guilty of violating that rule because I actually lost the second term. But the Supreme Court said, since you fully served the second term, that should be counted against you. Therefore, the Supreme Court said, I think it was the first week of May 2007, the Supreme Court said, you have no right to be in that position because that's already your fourth term. So what he did was to leave that position mid-May, meaning he did not serve for the remaining one and a half months. And he must have said thank you to the Supreme Court. Why is that? He lost the case and why should he be grateful to the Supreme Court? Because in that subsequent election, in 2007, he again won as mayor. <laughs> So, what happened? Can he be disqualified from running for that fifth time? The Supreme Court said in the case of Dizon, no. Why? Because there had already been an interruption given for a short period of one and a half months. So, it actually worked to his advantage. He won 
but actually it was a blessing in disguise. So now he is into what would be effectively his fifth term. And theoretically, he can run again for two more terms before the three-term limit would set in. So in effect, he would have served for how many terms? Seven? <laughs> Except for one and a half months. He would have served for seven straight terms. I think the mayor is a lawyer. Is it Morales? Is he from USD? I don't know. So you can actually appreciate how creative people could get. How they could benefit from what would otherwise be seen as a, a defeat. What is somehow interesting is the submission of of Justice Velasco in his separate opinion in the case of Rivera. Because if that position were adopted by the Supreme Court, then it would not have been possible for Morales to run for the fifth term. Why? You have to remember that under the case of Borja, the Supreme Court said the elective official should be able to serve the full term. So, as we can see, he did not serve the full term for the fourth time, short by one and a half months. So what was the position for the submission of Justice Velasco? And take note of this, because you might need it in the future when you would have a an election case, and you are for the Protestant. The position of Justice Velasco is that if there is already sub substantial service of the term, then that should be counted as one full term in order to now disqualify the, the candidate. So for instance, a term is for three years. If the elective official had served for two years, that should be considered a substantial service of the term, and that should be counted as one full term. So in the case of Morales, if you use that as a standard, it means that he would not have been allowed to run for the fifth term, because he would be deemed to have served the fourth term in full. Therefore, there would be a discontinu discontinuity only if he is not allowed to run the fifth time. Is he running again for the sixth time? <laughs> Are you friends with him? Can you find out from what school he graduated? <laughs> you tell him this case is quite interesting. <laughs> Who needs legal advisors? <laughs> In Montebon versus Comelec, if the vice mayor succeeded to the position of the mayor, and this was during his third term as vice mayor, then if he chose to run again for vice mayor during the next election, his third term would not be taken against him because there was an involuntary renunciation. He could not help but assume the position of mayor the moment the mayor retires, resigns, or dies. So even if he was already the vice mayor for the third term, since he became mayor during the third term, then there was an interruption. So if he decides once more to run for vice mayor during the next succeeding election, he can do so. In the case of Bolos versus Comelec, we have here a barangay captain 
who had already been serving his third term at the time when he decided to run for the position of a Sangkunian member. So at that time, the term for the barangay captain was much longer than that of a Sangkunian member. I think it was five years. So during that five-year term, the, the third term, he ran for Sangkunian of the municipality. He won. His term as a Sangkunian came to an end, but he did not run for Sangkunian again. Instead, he decided to run once more for barangay captain. Can he do that? The Supreme Court said no, because that would in effect be his fourth term. But there was an interruption when he became Sangunian member. Yes, but that is equivalent to voluntary renunciation. Because he actually left voluntarily in order that he can run for the position of Sangunian member. So that is voluntary and therefore should be taken against him. Now we have the case of Aldovino versus Comelec. This is something to do.